Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem. We greet you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh from my native island of Trinidad on this the 10th day of the month of Rabiul Thani of the year 1445. And my wife, Aisha, and myself, we are honored really to have as a guest in our home here in in the city of San Fernando, in Trinidad, uh, Sheikh Omar Baloch, who has traveled from New York to come and spend a little time with me. And I'm grateful to Allah. I'm grateful to Allah to have his company. And uh, Sheikh Omar Baloch is emerging, alhamdulillah, as a very promising scholar of Islam in the field of Islamic eschatology in particular. And this is something remarkable because there are no scholars, none. Uh, I, I pioneer the subject. I have uh, my own as assistant Hezbollah. And we have Abu Bilal Yaqub, who is um, uh, also uh, a promising scholar. And uh, although he's not a scholar of Islamic eschatology, I cannot omit the name of Yusuf Hindi. <laughs> oh, yes, Yusuf Hindi is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scholar and an emerging giant of a scholar. And he speaks both in English and in French. Uh, so these are all that we have at this time. But there is a legion of young people who have been listening to me, and tomorrow we pray that they will emerge as scholars of Islam. So since we have Sheikh Omar Baloch, I knew him when I was resident in New York, but he was a young man at that time. Maybe he was not yet 20. And uh, now after 25 years, I'm meeting him again, although we have had contact on emails and so on. And uh, I am happy and pleased with his growth as a scholar of Islam. And I want to invite Sheikh Omar Baloch to share with you today his insights and his views from the perspective of a scholar of Islam of events now unfolding so ominously in the Holy Land. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala Rasul al-Kareem. Amma ba'd. I'm the one who is thankful that you let me come and spend time with you. And uh, there are many, alhamdulillah, in the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many people and many scholars that are listening to Shaykh Imran. And they are uh, understanding what he's saying. And there will be many, I think, great scholars uh, that will emerge from this, the seeds that Sheikh Imran Hussein has laid down. And inshallah Allah will put barakah and I know there are people that are smarter than me. I would name them but I have not taken permission from the Sheikh. So I'll just leave it at that. As far as what is happening in the world today, I will start with building a connection between, since the Shaykh was talking about Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the State of Israel. I want to, from a different perspective, reinforce what he was saying. Surah Bani Israel or Surah Isra and Surah Kahf, these are twin surahs. They complement one another in very amazing ways. For example, Surah Al-Isra starts with Subhanallah. Surah Al-Kahf starts with Alhamdulillah. Surah Al-Isra talks about the Prophet ascending or traveling rather towards Jerusalem. Subhanallah, the Asra bi Abdihi, this word Abdihi. Over there, the Alhamdulillah, the Anzala ala Abdihi. Because this is not my subject, I just want to bring these connections in summarized format. Then, towards the end, both the surahs end with two quls. Over in Surah Al-Isra, قُلْ قُلْ اللَّهَ أُوذِ الرَّحْمَانَ أَيَّمَّا تَدْوُهُ فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَةِ And then, قُلِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدَوْهُ 
إلى آخر الآية يعني سورة الكهف the second last قل قل لو كان البحر right and then قل قل إنما أنا بشر مثلكم يوحى إليها so you can see there is a complementary relationship between the two surahs in reference to today's conversation there is another link that comes together and that is in Surah Al-Isra Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ لَا تُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنَ that Allah had ordained that Bani Israel will cause fasad in the world twice. And when we look to Surah Al-Kahf, instead of the word Bani Israel, another group of people are mentioned, in which people are complaining to Zulqarnain, and they're saying, "Inna Ya'juj wa Ma'juj la mufsidunna fil ard." Indeed, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are causing corruption in the world. Over there is لَا تُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ They will cause corruption in the world مَرَّتَيْنِ twice. So we, when we're reading Surah Al-Isra and we're reading Surah Al-Kahf together, we find that there is a link not only of Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the Holy Land from the previous surah, which is the subject that Allah is talking about, the history of the Holy Land in Surah Al-Isra in these verses that I just mentioned or referenced to but also that there is a link between Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the fasad that Bani Israel or the people of Bani Israel will cause in the world which is in today's world going to be known as the secular Zionist state of Israel so there is a strong link between the two and in this regard, I want to now turn to another aspect of the same, which is in these verses. I also want to mention something very interesting that came to my mind earlier today. That is the word Aqsa, or in Arabic, Ab'ad, far away. Masjid al-Aqsa, or this land, the holy land, this, even this city, you can say. There is something very interesting about it, and that is that it becomes very difficult to reach it in times where the Ummah, whether it be the former Muslim Ummah Bani Israel or it be the Ummah of Muhammad. It becomes very hard to reach the Holy Land or Masjid al Aqsa, the one that is far away. It becomes very hard to reach it when the Ummah of Muhammad or the former Muslim Ummah, the two Ummahs, when, or any Ummah for that matter, when they lose spiritual insight, when they lose connection with the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what happens as a result is that, like it happened in the time of Bani Israel, the Assyrians came from the north, and Nebuchadnezzar came from the east and removed them from Masjid al-Aqsa and made it very difficult to go to al-Aqsa or this, the Holy Land. And in our case, we've, we, we had the same fate. When the Crusaders came, when the Tatars came, it became very difficult. It was, it was too far. And in fact, there is a saying of the Prophet Wasallam. Though people have criticized the grading of the hadith, but it is still interesting to know that the Prophet talked about how difficult it will be to reach Al-Aqsa. Because the Prophet said when he was asked, what about the Holy Land? He said, go and pray there. And if there is a time of war, if there is a time of war and you cannot pray there, then at least send your lanterns of lamp. Like as if saying that there will be a time where that land will not have electricity. Send your lamps to that area. So Aqsa becomes, or Muslim Aqsa becomes a difficult place to reach when the Muslims lose the type of scholarship, that link with the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
that is extremely necessary. And Shaykh Imran Hussain is bringing us back to the Qur'an as the primary source of knowledge. That before you're looking at anything in the world, you first, even before looking at the sayings of the Prophet, look at those verses of the Qur'an that are clear in their message, the muhkamat, before you put other pieces of the puzzle together. I meet too many Muslims, they try to solve mysteries without knowing the foundations. They try to talk about the, the mysteries and the, 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 the symbolisms and so many things without looking, bringing together the foundation. And I think, honestly, wallahi, Shaykh Imran Hussain has already done the work. He's already brought the muhkamat at least, at least. I think he's done much more than that. But I don't think anyone can dispute, in my opinion, the fact that Shaykh Imran has bought, brought the pieces of, he's taught us how to bring the pieces of the puzzle together. He sticks with what is clear, what is from the Qur'an. And then he brings the other pieces together, looking at what's happening in the world. And yes, sometimes opinions change. That is the nature of, of learning. That's the nature of understanding. And so, alhamdulillah, that he is definitely one of the greatest scholars of this century. May Allah bless him. May Allah put more nur into his insight. May Allah give him many spiritual children. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take his work forward. Because this is probably the most needed work right now. Looking at things only from the perspective of Sharia will not give you a full picture. You'll be blindsided. Because let me give you one example. What happened? On, what is it, September 7th, when this uh, whole Gaza thing happened, when the whole, hum, the, the resistance in Palestine, when they took their steps, if they may not have taken some of these steps, or rather they wouldn't have taken these steps if they understood Islamic eschatology. If they understood that the goal here is Zionism, is to take, there's no Zionism without Jerusalem. There is no Zionism without the Mount Zion. There is no Zionism without that. Without understanding. You know, people say to me, Oh no, Allah would never allow the non-Muslims to take over Al-Aqsa. But Allah did it twice for the previous Ummah. Allah did it from the Crusaders from us in our own Ummah. And what is to say? And if you read the Qur'an, it almost, you may have to give an interpretation but it almost as if Allah is saying what the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Surely all those things will come to my Ummah that came to the previous Ummah. And Allah is telling us in the Qur'an they lost the Holy Land twice. And so Allah knows best. But I think the indications are that we're moving in the wrong direction without this field of study we will make many, many mistakes. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولساء المسلمين والمسلمات.